You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, and thanks for listening to Sustainably Geeky. This is episode 40. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about coral with Chelsea Erickson, and we've also got our regulars, Jen and Chris, on the line. Um, So Chelsea is with um, coral and she is based in Maui, Hawaii. Um, Ever since childhood, she has uh, loved the ocean. And today, as climate change threatens the fragile balance of many of the ocean's ecosystem, Chelsea, a double major in leadership studies and biology, is on a mission to help restore the ocean and promote conservation. In the past, she has participated in research on sea sponges and their role in the changing ocean atmosphere, contributing to a bigger picture of the effects of climate change on marine life. As research officer, Chelsea ensures the development and successful execution of a monitoring plan to measure the success of restoration activities in West Maui. So Chelsea, welcome to the show. Thank you for being on. Thank you so much for having me. I am also a sustainable geek, so I'm super excited. Yay! <laughs> we love hearing that. Um, so I guess tell us a little bit more about Coral and what you guys do. Yeah, so um, Coral Reef Alliance, or Coral, um, is an international NGO, and we have a pretty simple mission, which is to save the world's coral reefs. Um, not an easy feat, but pretty simple. Um, We kind of take a two-pronged approach to do this. Uh, We do, um, we reduce local stressors for coral reefs with our field teams and our field programs. And then we also are investigating conservation management strategies that will give coral reefs the best chance to survive in future climate change scenarios. Um, In Maui, which is where I work, Our field team is focused on reducing sedimentation, which is one of those local stressors. Um, And this is the amount of land-based dirt that ends up on the surrounding nearshore coral reefs. Um, And we're restoring the West Maui watershed to kind of address this problem of sedimentation. Uh, Watersheds, especially in places like Hawaii, where our mountains are so close to the ocean, um, we call it Mauka to Makai or mountain to ocean. Um, It's just the watersheds are basically the connection between the rainwater and the water sources on land and their route to the ocean. And this problem is magnified in places with this ridge to reef system. Um, So we install rows of native Hawaiian plants to trap sediment up on the mountain. And by keeping it there, we prevent it from ending up in the watershed and then ultimately on the coral reefs. Um, And my role in this team, again, is the research officer where I monitor the effectiveness of this restoration project. Wow, so I've heard of so many issues um, facing coral and I never even thought about sedimentation. That's another one to add to the list, I guess. (laughs) I know it's kind of, you don't think about it, but the sediment just sitting on the corals kind of suffocates them. Yeah. Well, um, tell us a little bit about what coral is for those listening who aren't quite familiar with it. Um, I know it plays a really big role in, in the ocean ecosystem. So if you can touch on that as well. Yeah. Um, So coral reefs are these beautiful calcium carbonate structures that actually house thousands of tiny little animals called the coral polyps. Um, These coral polyps have a symbiotic or beneficial relationship with algae, which gives them these beautiful, stunning, radiant colors we see. Um, And they also actually provide an extra food source for the coral polyps. Basically, uh, in return for the coral polyps giving them a home inside their tissues, the algae will actually give them some of their food that they make through photosynthesis. Um, And corals are super important to the ecosystem because they support some of the most diverse and valuable marine ecosystems in the world. Um, They're sometimes called the rainforests of the sea, and this is because corals provide fish and other marine organisms shelter, food, areas to reproduce and nurse their young, and a lot of other benefits for these fisheries. Um, And it's estimated that about 25% of the ocean's fish rely on healthy coral reefs. Wow, that's That's a lot Um, when we think about, uh, like you said, diversity and and the ability to support that, it's it's really huge. So if we lose these these precious reefs, um, we're really in a world of trouble. Yes. (laughs) I think I heard somewhere a statistic that, um, is it 70, 75% of the oxygen in the world actually comes from the ocean or or coral reefs? Mm -hmm. I think that's probably just about right. Um, it's so, all the processes are so linked and so, you know, complicated, but it's simplified. It is that 
we do our life source is the ocean and ultimately the ocean's life source is coral reefs um, just between connectivity supporting all of these uh, migrating fish like the bigger fish that technically wouldn't be supported by coral reefs are because they stop there on their way to their next place and things like that we are very reliant on coral reefs yes yeah, so we hear a lot about saving the trees and you know how important they are for for the air we breathe which is still important but um, obviously we need to focus a lot more on the ocean and the role that it plays in uh, capturing carbon and giving us oxygen etc cetera, etc cetera. definitely it's a huge resource for us that I don't think we always consider when we're thinking about conservation, um, but it also in turn can also kind of be a weapon against us if we don't do something to try to start to change the way our climate is going. For sure. Well, um, we've talked a little bit about climate change. Um, what is the effect of climate change on coral? So climate change, I, there are a ton of effects that climate, we're seeing with climate change and they're kind of hard to define. Um, but I like to think of climate change affecting coral reefs is the biggest thing is it's causing coral polyp stress. Um, climate change alters the environment that corals live in um, and exist and evolve to thrive in. And that they do that by making the waters warmer and more acidic. Um, and when corals are stressed, they're much more vulnerable to diseases, um, bleaching, and then ultimately coral death. Sorry. Can you talk a little bit more about bleaching and because I think people are more familiar with that than some of the other issues going on with coral. But so basically we, they just call it bleaching because it's too acidic or it's getting too warm. Yeah. Like, so the water um, is a huge factor for corals and coral health, kind of like our environment if we get too hot. I mean not to the same degree because two degrees can alter corals and cause them to bleach, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, we need homeostasis and that water changing is causing corals to lose that balance. Um, and coral bleaching ultimately happens a lot of times when we see warmer water and more acidic water. And this is just when the relationship between the algae I mentioned before and the coral polyp is disrupted. So when corals are stressed by climate, climate change conditions, pollution, local stressors, um, the algae living in their tissues is actually expelled. The coral shoots the algae out of their tissues. And this leaves the corals a bone white sickly color. You might see those pictures in the news, these pictures all over the Great Barrier Reef. That's the bone white sick color, um, which isn't always a dead coral, but it usually is. Um, because the bone white sick color is kind of a reflection on the state that the organism is in. Um, and unfortunately, corals can only live in this bleached state for a short, short amount of time. And if the coral does not recover, the stressor goes away um, and the algae repopulate the coral tissue, then the coral will die. Okay. I've been like scuba diving and snorkeling a lot around the world. And sometimes you'll see areas that are kind of covered in like a film or of some sort like what is that so that's going to be not beneficial algae so algae blooms and this is another relationship that affects coral reefs is when places are overfished and the herbivores are taken away for fishing and consumption um, they're not there to eat the algae off the coral and that's where that film or that algae bloom kind of explodes this can also happen when we see over nutrient water like runoff from farms, things like that are being filtered into the ocean, uh, flushed into the ocean, and this feeds the uh, harmful algae on the coral. So they're getting a step up when they already kind of had a step up. Um, so that is where that film comes from. Okay. I was just wondering. Like, yeah. Sometimes I'll be underwater and I'm like, what is that? <laughs> like, they're okay. It's not like the whole reef is you know, bad, but as you're going around, you'll see certain parts of different elevations that are affected more than others. But yeah, I know it's so weird the way it works underwater with all the currents and things. It's so hard to predict too. Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question is like, I, I know that they're repairing some of the, the reefs. They're, you know, planting little bits of coral and trying to get it to regrow do you know how prevalent that is and or you know is it just a very small amount of the corals that are going to be replanted or do you know any statistics 
Um, yeah, so this we call it coral restoration as kind of an umbrella term. Um, and there are many different organizations actually investigating this um, and they're out planting corals from nurseries, like you mentioned, um, like the Nature Conservancy, NOAA and Coral Restoration Foundation, to name a few. Um, and there are also some organizations something are out planting something we call super corals. The scientific name would be assisted evolution. Um, and they're exposing coral polyps to climate change effects inside the nurseries and then out planting those survivors onto coral reefs. Um, and I'm not exactly sure the scale, I think, I don't know how much work has been done to define that, um, but I know it is a re relatively new field with a lot, a lot of support, um, but there is a lot of research still needing to be done because it is so new um, to determine if it's a viable strategy. So do you know what percentage of reefs are no longer vi viable or are, will, are they possible to come back at all? Do you know uh yeah, it's estimated that about 50% of coral reefs have been lost in the last 30 years, and those are lost. Um, and there are unfortunately very few pristine left uh, reefs that remain. Um, but just because they're lost, there is something called evolutionary rescue. And so the hope isn't gone. Um, these corals could restore themselves. The genes could be um, swapped um, in the future. And all of these structures that even though the corals are dead, these calcium carbonate structures remain. And that actually acts as something a, a future coral polyp could settle on. So, I mean, ideally in the future, we could see so the return of some of those reefs. But I think it depends on a lot of other factors as well. So this, what is it called? Evolutionary rescue. Uh, rescue. Is that referring to the fact that coral takes so long to rebuild themselves and, and, you know, get that ecosystem back and that's just kind of speeding it up? Kind of. So evolutionary rescue is a little different than assisted evolution. Assisted evolution is working on basically speeding the evolution of the corals. And then evolutionary rescue is more referring to the natural process of evolution in the ocean, um, just to keep the key is diversity always. And so as long as we have that, um, corals ideally will be able to rescue themselves in a way um, with that diversity. Pretty cool stuff happening. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've also heard, um, going back to what you said about, you know, just two degrees can make a big difference in the coral's ability to survive. Um, but I've also heard that it can prevent them from reproducing or spawning. Um, is that correct? Or is that something I just made up? I think I haven't heard that necessarily, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Um, I think I could definitely do some more research into that as well, because that is something to know. And I think that coral spawning is going to be so important that we need to protect places that have high spawning rates. Um, and if two degrees can make the difference, that's really scary. <laughs> Yeah, because they need such particular conditions to survive and yeah, reproduce a lot of times. So that sounds it's like a, <laughs> it's like an intricate um, science experiment almost. <laughs> Definitely. We're still learning so much about corals every day. Yeah. Well, Chris, did you want to jump in with a couple questions? Sure. Um, I was watching uh, a David Attenborough show on Netflix. It's his new one. It's called Life in Color. And I came across, and I think it was near the end of the last episode, um, they were talking about some coral reefs doing this, th that they've noticed in the last 10 years, that some of these mildly stressed coral reefs are actually producing a neon color. And they call it, um, like, they're kind of producing a sunscreen for the algae that live within them to sort of keep them in there. And I just thought that that was freaking wicked to see all of a sudden you see it's like neon green or neon pink um coral reef which was pretty cool are you are you seeing that where you are are they doing that is that something that's actually common or is this just a little kind of clickbait thingy that the that the show did I think it's really exciting I haven't seen it here and I don't think it's been documented in Hawaii but that's just kind of a product of what I was talking about before is evolutionary rescue. These corals do have a lot of tools in their toolbox to try to adjust to these changing conditions. Um, we actually have a reef here that is 
they're starting to produce, there's been some tests run on Kahikili Beach um, that have really super heat resistant corals. So it's kind of a different kind of thing, but the same note is that they're just, they're figuring out ways. Which is, which is really cool. And speaking of sunscreen, as somebody who has to wear it, I live in the North. I don't experience bright sun, like a lot of sunshine all of the time and I have to wear sunscreen. Is, the, is there, I know there's this big push for specific ingredients to be taken out of sunscreen. Is it as big of a factor as the companies are making it out to be? Is this a greenwashing thing to sell more product? Um, how bad are, this, are specific sunscreen ingredients for coral reefs and which ones are they? Yeah, so the type of sunscreen is actually really important in places with high levels of tourism, um, which is often going to be those remaining pristine reefs around the world. They just, you know, attract a lot of people because they're so beautiful. Um, it's estimated that about 14,000 tons of sunscreen enter our oceans every year, which makes it a pretty significant source of pollution. Um, and so there are a couple of different types of sunscreen out there. Um, I like to group them as reef safe reef friendly and then all other sunscreens you're going to see either a reef safe or reef friendly label on the bottle and then a sunscreen bottle without either of those um, so the two components in sunscreen that are the most damaging to coral reefs are oxybenzone and oxysalate and research has shown that these chemicals make the corals more vulnerable to bleaching so if they weren't going to bleach they might bleach because they were exposed to the sunscreen um, and reef friendly sunscreen doesn't have those two chemicals, but it often still has derivatives of these chemicals that are just as harmful. Um, so it just kind of within the legal sphere, those two chemicals are the ones that are deemed making um, sunscreens not reef safe. So some companies have gotten around it by making reef friendly. Um, the reef safe sunscreen is going to be the safest bet when you are in the water near coral reefs. And that's anything that's titanium or zinc based. And that's proving to be the much safer option for when we're entering the water. Um, and making the consumer choice just to look at the ingredients when purchasing your sunscreen and choosing the zinc and titanium is probably one of the most important decisions people can make when traveling or even living in areas to keep the waters healthy for our corals. Um, yeah. It's, it's a lot harder to find those than you'd think, too, because once I started looking for them, every time I'd turn it, I'd be like, oh, it's, it's got the oxybenzone and all the stuff yeah. in it. So It's hard, especially in Hawaii. We have a lot and a lot of like the local surf shops will sell it. Um, not really the drugs. It's harder to find at the drugstores and the grocery stores. Um, but I kind of just live by the rule. If I can't say it, I don't always want it on my body either. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it is hard to find. And especially like in places that don't have water, there's no need really for it other than the fact that watersheds are ultimately connected to the ocean. Mm -hmm. So all of our water does filter through the ocean. Yeah, and it can take some getting used to. The consistency is a little different with zinc based than what we're used to. We've kind of gotten spoiled over the years. So Yeah, it's become so easy. The spray sunscreens, like the clear ones, I remember those. Those were my favorite as a kid because they're so easy. And now you have to take that 20 minutes to apply your sunscreen before you go in the water. <laughs> yeah, definitely a cool thing to consider. Chris, did you have anything else? I did want to make a note about the aerosol uh, sunscreens. There is an episode of Mythbusters and they did the whole... Um, how flammable are those sunscreens? And under like really rare, perfect conditions, you will catch on fire. So don't wear them. Use the That's cream. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So Perfect. I haven't worn them since I saw that episode. And my kids, I haven't put it on them since I saw it. Yeah. It may be easy. Wait, but hold on. Is it like the process of spraying it on? It could catch on fire, or is it like it's already on you, and there's just already near fire, fire, right? I think it's like a combination of the two wilts being near an open flame. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really like crazy perfect conditions, but yeah, because of how they're under pressure, um, yeah, they're flammable. <laughs> well, really I'm not, not surprising. <laughs> I feel like when you use the spray, you, you always can tell because your sunburns are like all crazy looking. <laughs> you never get like an even. <laughs> yeah, anyway. with the other stuff, you can at least see it going on and you have white so, streaks, that's fine. <laughs> you have like certain brand names that you like that are reef safe. Yeah, my favorite right now, there's a brand called Salt and Stone, and it smells really nice, and it's really natural, um, and it goes on 
pretty easy for I'm kind of used to the reef safe sunscreen at this point but for that one it goes on probably 10 minutes instead of 20. Um, and I also even though Sunbomb does make some that are not reef safe their mineral sunscreens are great um, and e even Tarte Beauty it's a beauty company but they all of their sunscreens and even foundation is zinc and titanium based and those are kind of my favorites. I think um, yeah. I've used Bear as well, B-A-R-E. Yeah. They've got some pretty good ones too. When I visited uh, Chris in Canada a few years ago, I had to buy some sunscreen on the fly and we were really excited that it was zinc based, but then it was greasy yeah, right. and all that stuff, but yeah. it, it worked, it worked really well. I don't have really a weird well. smell. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm kind of curious, so, you mentioned that there's a reef by you guys. There's a Great Barrier Reef. What are some of the other, um, I guess, more well-known or even less well-known reefs around the world that, you know, would be cool to check out? I think I'm a little biased because I think one coral polyp is awesome. Um, I think that kind of a lot of the, there's like Lou Key and the Florida Keys, which is beautiful. Um, but sometimes just the lower, smaller reefs, like especially on an island like Maui, just snorkeling off the beach is kind of your best bet um, because it's beautiful. There's not a lot of people there and you have all of this wildlife around you. Um, and especially in places that um, have a lot of tourism, I think going off the beach is so much fun and you never know what you're going to find. But also there's a lot of beautiful reefs out there. <laughs> Do you have a favorite animal that lives in the reef? Yeah, it's going to be the sea sponge because that's what I started out that's with. That's what I figured. <laughs> but I love it. I didn't even know what it was until I started researching it, but it is a pretty cool animal. Do you want to talk real quick about sea sponges and what they do? Yeah, so sea sponges are. are kind of like coral. Um, they are another cornerstone of different reef um, ecosystems. They're called sponge reefs. Um, and they, like I was telling you before, they're kind of impossible to kill. We, um, we're running experiments on them. Um, you can chop them up and they'll grow out of those little pieces. We call them sponge nubbins. Um, and we actually cut off all of the algae out of a sea sponge and then put it in a light tight box. And it was completely bleached. And we assumed that it might die, unfortunately. And we put it, when we took it out of the box, it was completely fine. We put it back on the reef and it repopulated itself with algae in like days. So they're just pretty, they're the first animals and they're pretty crazy. So that they're protected because, Sea right? Like, yeah. Um, I don't, I haven't heard, they, they are protected in the fact that they're protected inside marine protected areas. Um, I don't think there is, there also is some regulation on how much you can take for fishing because of the commercial sponges. There are com those one type of sponge is commercial um, that you kind of see in bathrooms and things like that. Um, but uh -huh. they're so prolific and so um, everywhere where they're like in the Florida Keys, they're everywhere. Um, in Maui, we don't really have any just because sponges never made it out here. We're in kind of the middle of the ocean. It's crazy. Um, but in if they're inside a marine protected area, they would be. But I don't think there's there's also much not not much consumer use for them um, other than okay. the sponges. I was kayaking uh, in the Florida Keys in the mangroves and our tour guide said that like maybe it was just a seasonal thing, but you, like you can't take the sponges or something. He's referring um, to the, there's one type of sponge and I'm blanking on the name right now, but it's like a ball. Um, and there, there are sponge fishermen that will go out there and kind of just, you know, stab them and stack them on their kayak. And he's probably talking about that because I know there are fishing regulations on that. Um, but that's really the only one that is, there's a commercial use for. The mangroves freaked me out. They were covered in these upside down jellyfish everywhere. Cassiopeia. Yeah, I got stung by like so many. They, they their, their little tentacles are like upside down. <laughs> and so like, you know, normally you see jellyfish and they're like this, yep. <laughs> floating around. And so when you're kayaking, sometimes you'll kind of like disturb them and they'll float around. And you're just like, these things look so crazy. Yeah, <laughs> Disoriented. <laughs> Like trying to swim around upside down. But yeah, I was like, if you fall out of this kayak, you will be so rounded in jellyfish. <laughs> like my worst nightmare. <laughs> they are scary because they, they're upside down. And if you disturb the area above them, they just release a cloud of singing cells. So you're swimming in their cells, essentially. And I, oh, 
they're not fun. <laughs> yeah, when we were kayaking, I swear we were like a foot above the the ground in the mangrove. It was just a very shallow area, and <laughs> like I am not getting out of this. Like kayak. Falling limbs inside the kayak. <laughs> yeah, but it was really cool. It was good to see. They're beautiful, but scary. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're I'm, talking. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to talk about jellyfish. Like, I feel like they're just taking over the oceans because they're, like, the only thing that can survive sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Too. It's kind of interesting to see there are specific organisms that are projected to actually do better in climate change scenarios. And, I mean, for the mass majority of organisms, it's going to be pretty harmful, but there are weird specific few that are actually going to get better at surviving. Like cockroaches cockroaches sea sponges actually that was a lot of my research was on experimenting in the changing ocean conditions okay. um i was just going to say while we're talking about mangroves um can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the coral and the mangroves and if there's a rainforest nearby you know how those ecosystems kind of work together I actually, so I didn't start studying coral until I moved out to Maui. So I don't know the relationship between mangroves and corals specifically, um, but I would just assume, you know, healthy because they all evolve together and probably work together. And I think healthy one means healthy other. Um, and that's generally the kind of the rule of thumb when we're talking about, especially ocean conservation, because everything is so connected. I think, yeah, I apologize. I threw that in there because I just <laughs> thought about it, but. <laughs> no, you're good. I would love to. I, there's so much to learn about corals. Well, I, I have heard that the um, the fish lay their eggs in the mangroves and they're kind of yeah. protected, especially like in Australia when I went, um, they were saying that the crocodiles out there kind of protect the babies. They're like, they're like their babysitter. And then they, you know, can swim out because there's a lot of predators, obviously everything in the coral reefs want to eat everything else. So <laughs> once they're big enough, they swim back and they're... Um, able to fend for themselves a little better. Yeah, I do know that mangroves are really important fish nurseries and that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like how corals have all those crevices, especially in the Pacific when they're just massive, these coral reefs. Um, and it's just, you know, hiding from predators at that point, but they're super important and they function, they have a really important function in the ecosystem. Jen, were you gonna say something? I was, but my dog started barking. Um, <laughs> So yeah, when we were doing the mangrove tour, the tour guide was saying that sometimes the mangrove serves as like a barrier for when hurricanes come in, it protects the inland area, but it also works in the reverse. So if there's rainwater coming off of the, the mainland into the ocean, it can serve as like a sediment sink. So that would therefore help the coral reefs from getting inundated with all that sediment. So when the mangroves go away, it's bad for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I know that in the Pacific or in Ma Maui specifically, and honestly, globally, corals also have that same function where they are breaking up the waves um, from storms and just all that power. So if we do lose the coral reefs, we're going to lose that function as well. And we'll see much faster erosion of our shorelines. So I think one of our other questions was, is, you know, let's talk about the hope and what people can do to help and you know, what are some of the good things that are going on that we can try to contribute towards? Yeah, so I think that is actually going to be my um, green life hack was to have hope because there are a lot of green life hacks like reuse your water bottles, you know, try to do the plastic free option. Don't put your groceries in plastic bags when you go to the grocery store, things like that. But I think it all kind of relates back to that hope. Um, I think it does get really overwhelming um, hearing all this information and seeing all these studies come out um, with pretty dismal projections. And I think that if we lose that hope, we lose that passion and that motivation to try to save and try to inspire ourselves to change. And I think that's going to be the key is we do have to see, honestly, wide scale global change. But luckily, there are a lot of passionate and dedicated people working towards that. Um, and just if you just kind of Google or go on hashtags, like we're so lucky that social media has exploded the way it did. Um, just hash searching hashtags like coral conservation and so many people are so proud to just share their stories. Um, there's a lot of compelling stories and 
that's where I find hope is other people and all of the things that are going on, like coral restoration, MPA establishment, and just how much funding and organizations really do care about the coral reefs, even though they only cover 1% of the world. A lot of people are starting to recognize just how important they are. So I think that's where we find the hope is in the inspiring nature of coral reefs, which is not hard to be inspired by because they're so beautiful. So other than the sunscreen thing, are there specific things um, people can do to help with the regrowth or is it more if you live in a coastal area, your actions directly affect them? I think kind of both the coastal, definitely, I think it's very important to reduce your plastic consumption when you're on the coast, um, just because you're, you're so close. Um, I think the really the most power, powerful thing people can do, even if they don't live near coral reefs, is just get in contact with your local and federal government officials um, and just kind of show how much we do care and how much we wanna see these protections increase and how much we do wanna see our carbon output reduced um, just to show that this is the future and we see it and so they should see it as well, bottom up, definitely. Maybe also if you do go and travel and see coral reefs, I see a lot of people that accidentally touch the coral reef with their flippers and so maybe you can talk to that a little bit. <laughs> yeah that's the first thing I tell people when I meet them if they're visiting um, is that corals are alive and I don't think a lot of people realize that um, and if you're stepping I mean they're so delicate and stepping on it kills it um, so I think it's hard because so many people don't know um, so it's hard to be like don't do that, you know, because they're just not aware. But at the same time, I like to say, be a conscious explorer, um, just because exploring is beautiful and it's part of the human condition. We love to do it. But if you're in any place, this is a general rule for anywhere is don't, you know, try not to touch things because you don't know what you're doing to them, especially if you aren't educated about where you're going. Um, but yeah, it's tough and it's it's a huge issue we see here just because there are so many people wanting to check out this beautiful reef and don't know. Yeah, I always get angry when I see them and I yell at them. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like the instant reaction. I'm like, oh no, just stop. <laughs> like you have like your, your mask and your snorkel on and you're trying to like wave at them and be like, stop touching it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm really pointing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So maybe just education too for yeah. like all these tourists. I mean, you would think that if you're a tourist company taking people out to the coral reef that they would try to be like, don't try to take a break from swimming and stand on the reef or whatever. I, I like think the one I went on did that. Sorry. Yeah, a lot of the company. no, you're good. Um, a lot of the companies are expanding into ecotourism, especially we're all realizing that, you know, ecotourism relies on healthy coral reefs um, or even tourism relies on healthy coral reefs. So a lot of companies are switching to that eco and they're giving a lot of information to people that go out on tours like that just to be like, this is why, you know, um, yeah. but it's a, sl it's a slower process than I think it needs to be. And I would love to see it on like airplanes with a safety video if you're traveling to somewhere tropical, like that's a quick inter information about where you're going and what everything is alive. In Hawaii, everything is alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When yeah, I, I, I think, sorry, this one thing too, is just if you're booking some sort of trip, like make sure you're supporting a company that does do ecotourism stuff versus. Maybe yeah, like definitely investigate the company because even if they aren't officially an ecotourism company, a lot of the companies here give back so much to the community. Um, so just checking them out before you book is a great way to travel sustainably. Yeah, most definitely. When I um, I got to go to the Great Barrier Reef uh, a couple years ago and the tour that I went on, the guy was very passionate about coral and conservation. And he went into this whole spiel about how Australia was going to lose their World Heritage um, Association because the reef were dying. And um, if they don't reverse it, they might lose it. And, you know, that was a shocker to me, but it was good to see, you know, folks taking it that seriously and um, advocating for less fossil fuel usage and things like that. 
Yeah, I think another key to conservation is collaboration. We all like you can be in science, you can be in biology, you can be in marine biology, but you always need help. We can't be experts in everything. Um, and I think collaboration between fisheries, local communities, engineers, um, geologists, it's like we can all work together to solve these issues. I think that's the key piece right now. And I would love to see more of that happening. Science is an amazing thing when we apply it correctly. Yes. <laughs> well, ladies, did you have any other questions for Chelsea? Questions, comments? Um, I would like to know, why did you pick Hawaii as your, I mean, I, I've seen pictures, I've seen YouTube, it looks beautiful, um, but but why live in such a, it's because it's a very isolated series of islands too, so why why Hawaii? Um, growing up, I always had a, I mean, I grew up on the Jersey shore, um, and I've always been fascinated by the ocean. I mean, a lot of people that live there are, but I just like the way it smelled, the way the waves moved. I was always learning something. Um, even shipwrecks were fascinating to me and all the life that lived in them. Um, so I had this, what I thought was a pipe dream to move to Hawaii since I was a kid. And so I went to college, I studied sea sponges, and I was just kind of looking for jobs. And I applied to one in Hawaii thinking, like, what are the chances? And I got it. So then I moved out here the day after I graduated. That's all right, then. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I accidentally muted you, Chelsea. Um, yeah, that's not a bad first job. <laughs> no, that's uh, sad. Awesome. I love it here. Maui magic. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anything else, ladies? Is there anything you wanted to touch on, Chelsea, that maybe we didn't get to? Um, well, if you just want to learn more about um, Coral Reef Alliance, you can check out our website at coral.org. And if you wanted to talk to me, I love to talk to people. So um, you can email me and my email's on the website as well. Awesome. Are there any um, resources you would share with our listeners, whether that's websites, videos, social media accounts, books? I think um, NOAA um, has a really good outreach program. Coral Reef Alliance has a really good one as well. We're constantly updating blog posts and videos and things like that. But I get they NOAA has a really um, concise way of kind of letting out all the literature on science or on coral conservation. They have a whole page for just coral reef conservation. And then, I mean, they have a whole thing on all the oceans. So NOAA is generally the place I go to. But again, like I mentioned before, just searching hashtags on social media um, or even just taking like 10 minutes, 15 minutes out of each month to just kind of dedicate yourself to the research because it, sometimes the information, there is so much out there and it is hard to find. Um, but just kind of taking that 10, 15 minutes a month to just catch up is the best way I would, those are the resources, I guess I would say, um, not directly a resource, but that is my process. Awesome. Um, well, let's go ahead and move on to our green life hacks. Um, Chelsea, I know you kind of gave yours already, but is there anything you'd add to yours or you want to reiterate what you already said? Uh, well, yeah, I also, a process I live by, um, again, is just gradual. I'm a big fan of doing things gradually because I think changing habits is really hard, um, but I kind of challenge myself to something new each month. Like, the first one was obviously just make sure to bring my reusable water bottle everywhere because it's hard to remember, you know, you have it. Um, and then I kind of progressed. I started bringing Tupperware to restaurants before COVID hit, unfortunately, and now it's kind of much more difficult. Um, but a lot of restaurants will still put your food in your own Tupperware, so you don't even need to get the takeout containers. Um, and then at the grocery store, it's just funny to me to see the little veggie plastic bags that you put your veggies in just to take them out. Um, I think it's just kind of looking around you and challenging yourself to these little things that are um, just slowing down. And because I, you know, you think about, you don't even think about it sometimes just putting the veggies in the little thing because that's what it's there for. Um, but just challenging yourself to break a lot of habits. Yeah, 50, 60 years ago, we didn't have um, all this disposable stuff. And yeah, they, they managed just fine. <laughs> it was, what is it? I think a hundred years ago, plastic was invented. And like mm -hmm. the complete takeover is astonishing, but shows how fast we can change. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, Jen, what is your green life hack this month? Um, so I saw some phone cases that are biodegradable um, when I was in the Florida Keys. So 
if you're ever in the need for a new phone case, oh yeah, there you go. People um, have <laughs> they, they are biodegradable. Look at all of you guys. Everyone has them. That's awesome. Um, and then I was gonna show my my sun bum sunscreen, but we already talked about it, so that's <laughs> it. <laughs> their brand smells really good too. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris, how about you? Um, so uh, we have a dishwasher at this house. It is a older model, and when um, and I haven't had a dishwasher in seven years, so I'm a little rusty. Um, so I was buying these Nature Clean Pod things to just chuck in, and it was gumming up our dishwasher. We were weren't like Ray was particularly getting frustrated as to why the dishes weren't coming out clean. Turns out older models can't actually break them down. So what we had to do with the rest of them was break them open and put them in the little dispenser thing. And then I just put the the just the plasticky stuff, which is not plastic, but it looks like it in the compost. Um because it can actually bung up your dishwasher and then it could break if you don't notice or don't clean it. Um, so yeah, so liquid detergent only for older model. Newer ones can handle it. Newer ones are actually made for those little pods and they're fine. They can break them up, no problem. But ours, I think is almost 10 years old and it actually can't break it down very well. So it just leaves a slime everywhere and it gums up the mechanisms and stuff. So yes, just use liquid dishwasher stuff. I'm glad detergent. I never tried those in my old dishwasher. <laughs> I just thought it was being convenient. I'm like, here, we'll just pop one in, close the thingy, and it's good to go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and always run your dishwasher full because it uses yes, the same amount of water it, as half runs, yeah. so you're saving water that way. <laughs> yes. and Bonus hack. <laughs> yes, yeah, always run it full, and the same with your washing machine. Mm -hmm. Well, my green life hack... Um, I'm kind of cheating because we've already talked about this, but mine was going to be about the sunscreen. Of course, we talked about using um, zinc or titanium based, um, but also there are options, clothing options now that serve as SPF, um, you know, they'll list what SPF they are. So there's a lot of shirts. I forget what they're called. There's a name for the specific type of shirt I'm talking about. Rash, is it Rash Guard shirts? Something like that. Um, but yeah, they, they actually say that they, they protect from UV rays. Um, and then of course, hats are always a great way. Um, if you're going to be in the sun, you know, and you're not swimming, you could just wear long sleeves and pants, of course. But um, yeah, just being aware of other alternatives to chemical sunscreens, um, because there are a lot of ways out there to protect yourself and mm -hmm. always wear something. That's really popular in Hawaii because of yeah. all the sea urchins. Oh, really? <laughs> Another layer of protection. <laughs> Jeez. Things you don't think about living in Texas. <laughs> um, well, with that, uh, where can we find you and or Coral online, Chelsea? Um, so you can find us at coral.org and then under the my or our team page, my email and contact information is listed. And Jen, can we find you anywhere else online yet? No, nope, you have exclusive rights. <laughs> How about you, Chris? You can find me here and on our other Epically Geeky shows, Marginally Geeky and Creatively Geeky. And I think we're doing a Epically Geeky episode this Saturday. We bumped it up because apparently Geeks Weekend is coming up. So, yeah. And you can find me on Instagram at Rose and Hummingbird. Great. And I can be found on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Het's Gonna Be Me. Um, you can find the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Sustainably Geeky. And of course, you can listen anywhere you stream podcasts. Um, we're also on YouTube and all the social media. So um, if you haven't already, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating or a thumbs up or whatever your preferred medium allows you to do. We do appreciate it. Um, if you ever have ideas for shows, um, shoot us an email or uh, a message through through Facebook um, and we will definitely take you up on it. So Chelsea, thank you again for being on and um, we appreciate this great conversation about the importance of coral. Everybody have a great night. Yes, thank you so much.